Do I have to do an intro and stuff? I've never done this before. Hey, <laughs> What's up, everybody? Welcome to another edition of the Pipeline Podcast. I am your host, Wes Carter, uh, here with John Feltz from Cruise Foam, all the way from Santa Cruz, California. Welcome, John. No, awesome, Wes. Stoked to be here. You guys got quite a place here, so it's it's fun. I'm, I'm excited to chat. Nah, we appreciate you guys bringing your whole team over here. Um, this is a really special place, and it's been fun to uh, bring all of the collaborators around New Earth and around sustainability together. And um, we sort of did a trial run last year, but you know now that we're fully mature, <laughs> it's uh, good to have um, our allies and advocates here. And um, really, really stoked um, to have your team here, and also just incredibly excited about the products that we're going to bring to market together. Um, I know the audience will be really interested to hear about Cruise Foam and this really revolutionary technology uh, of taking an organic material um, and turning it into something that's really functional to replace uh, a really problematic type of packaging. So tell us a little bit about Cruise Foam and uh, we'll get into it. Yeah, let me grab one of these. So, I mean, Cruise Foam at its heart is like you said, how can we understand how to make materials better at the heart of it and do it in a way where we really connect with things that are already out there in existence. You know, there's so much that is just prevalent in nature, prevalent around us every day, that just goes missing. And people just don't understand the potential behind it. There's, there's so much potential and so much we can learn from nature and the millennia in which it's been able to figure out these incredibly complex problems that you know, we see every day and just build systems that work within that already created, already harmonized global kind of ecosystem that you see in nature. And so cruise foam at its heart, like you said, is really trying to tackle one of the worst materials that I think we, we would all say plastic foams. There is just nothing good about them, except maybe, you know, they perform. But right. when you look at really where the opportunity lies there, it's enormous. There is so many use cases for what we've built with cruise foam and looking at these materials. And it's funny being here and sitting here and seeing all these people that have come through this house. It's absolutely incredible. The origins of cruise foam are from surfing. So yeah. it's, it's absolutely just How about that synergy? hilarious. It's <laughs> hilarious. And, you know, like the ideation for this came from the ocean. Me and my co-founder were sitting out there, and we just look at what we're riding, and it's just this perfect representation of what could be done better. You know, you're on this board. It's connecting you in this medium of the ocean that, I mean, any surfer, anybody that's been in the ocean knows what that feels like. But it's literally a product that at, at its core is – destroying things okay like i had heard this part of the story you, you actually know? were sitting on a surfboard when you originally yeah. had this idea yeah me and my co-founder okay. we, we we had a we had a thing that we, we we couldn't do it once we got to a certain size but we'd have our board meetings out, out in the lineup so <laughs> I love it. that only worked until we got about five people and then a few of them didn't surf and we kind of were like well we can't force them out into the lineup right but, on yeah it was cool it was a cool well, one of the things I love about this product is, you know, the holy grail when we're looking at circularity is creating a usable product from waste. Yeah. You know, there there are a lot of, quote, bio-based products coming to market now, but a lot of those bio-based uh, products rely on industrial farming, as an example. Yeah. Like, we're having to grow uh, the materials. This literally is a product, and you tell me, my sense is that's just disposed of. Yep. And so you've taken a waste product that's going to end up up in a landfill most likely maybe in a compost pile but most yeah. likely in a landfill and turned it into a really usable product that when that product's use case is done it will decompose right back into organic material uh, like the way it started so like how <laughs> how did you harness that I mean yeah, wh where, where did the shrimp casings come from i mean was that divine intervention did it, did like a strike of lightning <laughs> shrimp casings that's what we'll use it, it feels like that sometimes i i, I think you're, you're spot on you know when you look at how we're approaching cruise foam and the materials and the technologies it's understanding that circularity it's understanding that you can't just have a siloed view of like this will fix the waste problem but it's where are we getting those materials to make that product how are we manufacturing that product how are we distributing that product how can we understand that the impact starts at the beginning and comes full circle to the end? And for us, we solely right now only make our materials out of waste byproducts. We're not trying to take anything virgin. We're not trying to take anything that requires higher impact that doesn't already exist from these other processes that are creating these wastes. And that's where we just see such enormous opportunity when you look at so much is unutilized in these industrial processes. Just because people haven't 
just put energy to it, it seems like sometimes. I, I can't imagine I'm the first person that's ever thought of using waste products for this, but I think it's understanding the potential of how you harness that in an effective way and understand it's not only about making a material, but you have to take the next step. How do you manufacture it? Sure. How do you scale it? Sure. And then the cherry on the top for me is, you know, yes, it's composts, but at, we've really designed our materials to be earth digestible, to be regenerative. And so in a perfect time of life, yes, if we go into composting. But say this ends up in the ocean, ends up in your gutter, it's not going to do any harm. Sure. It'll be gone in a month or two. And the idea is there's an optimal path, but even in its worst disposal, it's not detrimental to any of those ecosystems. So in the early days of cruise foam, you guys were like, let's see if we can make surfboard blanks out <laughs> of shrimp casings. Is that right? That's a story that I heard. That's and then 100% I guess you, true. You yes. figured out pretty quickly, maybe that's not the best use case for this material. And then quite honestly, pivoting to packaging, oh pivoting to packaging is pretty brilliant. That's a lot bigger market, first of all. Um, oh. But I, I, I've really been um, really blown away at the potential for this product. Um, I remember when I first got introduced to you, guys um, actually through an investor friend of mine that's like hey I've heard about this company out on the west coast and they're doing something really you know prolific and you should check these guys out um, and this was probably five or six years ago and then when you guys came to Charlotte to our solution center um, this fall I was stunned at the progress you guys have made. So tell us a little bit about that whole R&D process because Oof. from where you started to where you are, you obviously had a lot of time and energy and really talented people yeah. working together to bring these products to market. Yeah, you're spot on. The, the team we built is bar none. I, I couldn't be more proud of the team we've been able to build. But going back to the original days, it's, it's, it's fun to remember that. To a degree. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to a degree. It, it was tough. It was tough. You know, you're in a closet trying to make surfboard foam. And literally, we had, it's funny, our first employee who is an intern through the community college, he now works for us full time. He, he took a stint to go back to school for three years and then came back to work with us, which is just a great story. Right. He built our first blank molds out of steel that he welded and that we tried to blow our foam into molded blanks. Good, oh my, it was. Total mess. It was a total mess. I, I wish I could show you pictures. There's just this like soup of, of foam that's in this blank mold and you're just like, what are we doing? But what's funny is it really was the seed of what we've been able to achieve and what we really been bring to Charlotte is even for surfboards, we knew if we could create the material that's not enough. We right. need to find a way to scale it, a way to manufacture it. And for me, it's always understanding the lower barriers to entry is trying to interface with how it's done today. How do we make these adoption pathways easier, not only for us, but to benefit us, it's making it easier for the people that are actually going to already be out there having these established you know, customers, distribution, so much logistics that have been built over the last 50 decades plus. And it's trying to break that down when you're already introducing a new material, a novel material, it's never going to work. And that's when we understood surfboards, we're trying to make it a blanks, clearly didn't work. But we well, knew. Oh, yeah, it yeah, sort yeah. of works. It sort of works. It sort of works. We're getting there. In it comes full circle, it's right? It comes full circle. Yeah. Um, but taking that same ethos, if you will, we looked at foams, plastic foams, single-use materials. One of the most you know, common ways it's made is through extrusion. Yep. And so when we looked at that and we made the pivot, we said, if we're going to make this material, the only way we're going to make this effectively is through things like extrusion. And that's where when we interfaced and we started really developing, we brought on some incredible people. We brought on people that came from Ohio out to Santa Cruz, 30 years plus experience. I'm like, who are these people that are coming out here to join this crazy company that's trying to extrude shrimp foam? And you just see this passion that exists in these industries that I think you're seeing this transformational moment in supply chain in general that people want to do better. There's just so m little technology advancement that's being adopted at scale because of these issues that I've been you know, laying out. And that's where we want to remove those and make this adoption happen quicker because it has to. Well, and that was another thing that impressed me when I first was talking to you guys. You recognized really early on that we have to have a material that can be manufactured with the current extrusion infrastructure that exists. Yeah. And that's, you know, a pretty brilliant thing to understand in the beginning because I have seen a lot of companies, you know, innovators in the packaging space that are bringing products to market and they miss that piece. Yeah. And all of a sudden they have a really cool technology, but it just isn't scalable yeah. because, oh, you need this custom equipment or maybe we have to 
the design equipment for it, yep. and the capital required to do that is massive. But you know, and, you know, when we got to know each other, you guys finding some existing organizations that are already extruding these products that can help with the R and D as well, who have knowledge of it, and then being able to actually produce it at scale um, is the real difference maker. Because at the end of the day, like a lot of the organizations bringing products to market, if they don't have that. Even if they got the greatest technology in the world, it dies on the vine. And exactly. So what, what I've seen is this has an incredible runway. Um, and, and the technology, even in the early stages, how long have you guys been doing this? Five Oof. or six years? Yeah, now? six years. Six okay. years. I mean, so. so you're still relatively young and you've yeah. already come up with a lot of really, really innovative products. I think we're super excited. And it's like, you know, when we look at that pathway forward, it's so built on understanding those avenues of acceleration for us it's through partnerships. It's through right. understanding. Like people have done a lot of this before. We don't need to rebuild Rome. Right. It's like how do we understand what we do well and understand what people already existing do well, and then align those kind of you know resources and align passion and do something really special. And that's when I think what we're we know visiting you guys and being a part of you know what we're trying to build together. We look at these products and this is just the tip of the iceberg. I think there is so much potential behind what we can do and really bring this technology initially into foam and into packaging but good lord there is so much that needs to be changed when you look at supply chains from the top to the bottom and for us this is just a great example of where that can go yeah, well, we're we're really thrilled at Atlantic Packaging about you know working with you guys, and I think you mentioned the word passion. Um, anytime we're looking at building partnerships, um, that is actually one of the first things I try to identify <laughs> is are the people in this organization passionate about what they're doing? Um, because passionate people tend to have tremendous drive and an innovative spirit, and um, we've built our whole business that way. You know, about having really passionate people that care, uh, that want to make a difference, and with this this world of sustainability it's going to require that yeah. and a new earth project i mean the inception of that whole initiative has been about how do we harness the stoke of the surfing yep. community in particular to help us create branding around sustainable packaging yep. and say to the world this is awesome Let's stop looking at these transitions as something that we have to do, and let's start looking at it in some, the things we want to do. Yep. Let's celebrate these changes. Let's talk about how amazing it is that we now know how to make foam out of shrimp shells, you know? <laughs> and let's look at every application imaginable where that's a viable product, yep. you know? And so um, the culture of cruise foam really matched up well with Atlantic, and, you know, we're really thrilled that, you know, here in the coming months, you know, uh, our two organizations together are going to be bringing these products to market and you know we've talked a lot about the different verticals whether it be appliances electronics you know cold chain which is shipping you know refrigerated type meals um, mailing solutions um, sort of the sky's the limit anything yep. that requires protective foam um, and to your point I, I think there's opportunities to even come up with some things that we may not have thought of early on uh, as we get some experience with this but you know you've, yeah I mean let's hear it from the other side talk a little bit about what you guys impression was of our organization and and why you guys felt like they were such a good match no you know you're spot on when you look at the alignment it was there from the beginning you know when we look at how you guys are built your company over time the real you know principles the values the ethos that you've just ingrained in your organization is incredibly impressive from the top to the bottom the people you work you know that are on your team the way that you approach partnerships the way that you're looking to tackle this problem is holistic and I think for us that's the most important part is that alignment because it's going to be challenging it's going to be tough but I think the ones that are willing to take that head on are the ones that win they're the ones that make the change happen and that's proven throughout the history of time and I think when we see you know where your company started it's an absolute incredible story and I think what you've been able to transform into has really kept that kind of core and applied it to things, you know, like packaging, like supply chain, in a way that completely differentiates you from the other people that we've seen in this industry. And we have a lot of people that are interested in this type of material. It's not a surprise, but there's so many that are looking at it from the wrong angle, right. looking at how to tackle it in a way that is just not going to have the impact that we need to have at the rate that we need to have it at to see the change that needs to happen around this planet. Mm -hmm. And for us, it's clear as day that you have that same understanding. And, you know, there's maybe some value we could get more elsewhere, but that's not the point. The point is we want to see change more than anything else. That's right. And at the end of the day, if that change doesn't happen, who cares about money? We're not going to have a plan to live on. 
so you know i got a four-year-old daughter like these these things are so much more important to me when i look at why we're doing this why this partnership makes so much sense and where i think it can go is just you know I don't want to say limitless, but it kind of feels that way. No, I'm with you. And I think that's a good point, too. You know, people ask me from time to time, like, is a New Earth Project, a, a, is it a nonprofit, or is it, you know, and I'm like, it's, 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 it's an initiative that's inside of our for-profit company because, yeah. quite honestly, the for-profit companies in the private sector, we need to be partnered with nonprofits. Nonprofits do amazing work, uh, especially when it comes to advocacy and R&D and things like that. But in order for us to, quote, heal the supply chain, the organizations in that supply chain have to, quote, <laughs> heal. And, you know, this is a great product, you know, that's, or a great example of a product that when you look at EPS foam as an example everybody who's ever gotten a washing machine or a TV that white EPS foam it does work but it is not recyclable no. it sure ain't compostable no. and if it ends up in the environment the things that I the things that I've read said it never decomposes no. like it's there forever yeah. you know and so it, it is you know when you're looking at products that we need to replace it is right you know it is number one on the list and now we have a product that we can continue to innovate for a lot of applications that have used that before so uh, again you know for us at Atlantic being able to be an activator of <laughs> innovators like you and that's totally. really how I see it you totally. know is to be able to Activate innovation uh, and help bring it to market um, is the perfect partnerships for us. You're so spot on, and I, you know, when you talk about EPS in these films, it's it's that's one of the reasons we were so drawn to attacking this problem. Is you know, surfboards was obviously the ideation behind it, but when we saw just what had been developed over time around how this material has been utilized, there's certain things you're just like, why is this what it's being used for, and how is this the solution that was arrived at? when you look at the progression of, you know, basically the growth of products, e-commerce and everything. And I think over the last year or so, two years, COVID and everything, so many more people are buying things online, things you would never buy online. And I'm not the only one, I'm sure I've tried with, I can't count how many people. You buy one piece of furniture, one TV, all of a sudden your entire trash bin, everything you have is just overflowing with EPS. So now you can't even throw anything else away. That's right. And then if you did want to throw it away or anywhere, there's nowhere to take it. There's, I was telling this story to, to um, some of my team earlier this week. There's one quote-unquote recycling machine in Santa Cruz for EPS. It is the most horrendous machine I've ever seen in my life. It is a container that has a heated tube or a vessel. There's two guys in there that sit in there just breathing fumes. It's disgusting. And they pump this EPS into it, melt it down, and it comes out as this hardened tube that they put on a pallet, and they go make, you know tiles for which is great i'm glad they're doing something with it but when you look at that you're like this is the most optimal way to dispose of this material it's terrifying well and you're turning it into a product that's eventually going to have to be disposed exactly. of exactly anyway. you and, know you're just delaying the inevitable it, to your point it's better than nothing but barely it's so <laughs> bad and then like for me the problem that really really steps out for me is like you're saying it breaks into microplastics it never goes anywhere and when i look at you know the best you know, picture, worst picture of that, I guess, it's the ocean. Yeah. Because there's certain things where, yes, we can collect it, although I would argue we're accelerating the production as far as what we can actually collect, so I don't think that's a winning path forward. You can't collect microplastics from the ocean. You just can't. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, 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 I think getting rid of the garbage patch, those are such important initiatives, so many things that need to be done, but there's certain materials that just can't be collected in that fashion. EPS, styrofoam, so many things that are just littered out there will never be removed ever. Well, and, I and think, that's terrifying. I think that's an important point to bring up. And I, you know, for our audience out there, you know, just to throw a few facts. Right now, it's estimated that as a you know global community, we put about 11 million tons of plastic in the ocean every single year. As awful as that is, estimates are by 2040, so less than 20 years, that number could be as much as 36 million tons. Yep. We're going to triple, not the amount, we're going to triple the rate every single year. And so you can ask, you know, any of our friends here. I know we just did a beach cleanup recently, and I saw Koa Smith was out there sifting through the sand and getting microplastics. And here in the Hawaiian Islands, those microplastics are everywhere. Yeah, and so what yeah. is it going to look like when we're putting three times as much in the ocean? And this is not way off into the future. No. you got six-year-old daughter. I've got nine-year-old. Yeah, it's happening now. Our children will, will 
will bear the brunt of what this is going to do to our, our, our ecosystem. And it's one of the reasons that I do feel like there's tremendous urgency yeah. to the work that we're doing. Um, and, you know, I also think that products like this and partnerships like this are a move in the right direction because this is a way to celebrate a really important win. Yeah. And, you know, for people to adopt these products, you know, this, this, you know, this has to be a moon landing for our generation. And to me, cruise foam, I mean, this is a space shuttle to the moon. Yeah. Um, so really, really excited about what the potential is. And, um, you know, as, as we're closing up here, tell me a little bit, you know, because we are here at the pipeline studios, <laughs> um, you know, with uh, the famous uh, pipeline wave uh, in, in the background and we're hoping to see some really uh, prolific and amazing surfing in the next few days. What is the influence of just surfing in the outdoors on all of this? Do oh you think goodness. that, do you think any of this would have happened without no. surfing? Without it? No, I, I, I've always been tied to the ocean my entire life, but there was, there was a moment in my college years where I live in Santa Barbara and, you know, I lived basically on the beach and I was surfing every day, but I, I, I look back and I, I, I went into college and I did my, I did it chemical engineering is what I did my undergrad in. And I went in thinking I'd be a petroleum engineer, which is absolutely <laughs> hilarious to you think went, about. You went the now. other direction. It is absolutely <laughs> hilarious to think about. I thought I'm going to go in there, I'm going to be a petroleum engineer, make tons of money, I'll be happy. How wrong is that perspective? I mean, at least I had that realization. And it, and it happened my junior year. I had a pretty life changing moment where my mom had a stroke and, and, and it kind of redefined my you know core drivers if you will and it was just this time period where for me personally it was so transformational and the medium which really spoke to me and and, and helped me develop that that clarity was the ocean mm -hmm. and and really what it built was this connection where i thought it's a weird thing to say but the, the answers are out there and it was a personal answer i needed at the time sure but it developed over, you know, my early career and then meeting Marco to have that realization of understanding, like, nature offers us so much. And I think the ocean is probably, by far, in my opinion, the greatest representation of that. Not only it's obviously the largest mass, you know, on, on the planet, but there's so much unknowns about it. Sure. There's so much to be discovered about it, which just fills me with excitement that I can't even, like, fully contain. And it, it just brings this, you know as the case study where this is just the, the tipping point where I think, you know, nature can take us. And is, if we follow nature and if we really align, you know, the longevity of the human, you know, the human race with, with what really needs to happen and that, that, that transformation, it's going to be a special time period to be involved with. And I think for us, we just want to make it happen sooner. <laughs> well, I mean, well, well said. I mean, it's really appropriate, you know, at the birthplace of surfing where we sit today and you know we've talked a lot you know over the years about really what this is is a return to indigenous knowledge and if you, if you listen to the history of these islands and the people who inhabited these islands they understood balance yeah. they understood how to harness the power of nature and all we're really trying to do is just remember that yeah 100%. And, um, so it couldn't be more appropriate that um two uh, average surfers are sitting across <laughs> from each other at, at the <laughs> average bottom. is a nice term <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You might. I'm saying for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, we're we're here at Pipeline introducing a product, um, and and we are asking the community of surfers, um, just like John and I, to you know to be advocates for sustainability, to be advocates for conservation. You know, yeah, um, a New Earth Project was founded with that idea that surfers more than anybody else should be the advocates of the ocean, because what you said is really um, profound to me. I mean, I think. All surfers know what you're talking about. We've all found out answers out there, yeah. and um, and this is a this is a beautiful answer. So again, thank you for what you guys have done. We are thrilled to be partnered with you no, guys and bring this well. product to market. And um, yeah, let's uh, let's have a great week, man. Let's thank do you. It. No, cheers, cheers, guys. Yeah, Appreciate cheers, it, man.